Welcome to the China Mina Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Fulton, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a political scientist at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. When we talk about extra-regional powers in the Middle East, we tend to focus on the U.S. and China, but don't take your eye off of India. With historically long religious, cultural, and economic ties, India has always had a deep presence in the region. In recent years, however, this has taken a more strategic turn as New Delhi has been engaging across political, diplomatic, and security issues as well. To tell us more about India's footprint in the Middle East and the larger geopolitical consequences, I'm delighted to be joined by C. Raja Mohan. Raja is a senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute in Delhi, uh, a division of the Asia Policy Center um, in Mumbai. He's a visiting research professor at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, where he previously was the director. Raja, thanks so much for joining us. Wonderful being with you. Okay, so Raja, can we just can we start with a, a brief overview of what India's interests in the Middle East are? How have they changed in recent years? And are there any countries in particular that are more strategically important to India? Look, I think, uh, as you mentioned in your initial remarks, uh, India has had a very close uh, link with the, the Arabian Peninsula, with Iran, uh, and the further uh, in Levant and North Africa. So it's a long-standing relationship uh, that, has, that has been there. Uh, three things have changed, I would say, in the last uh, 40, 50 years. One... India is a major importer of energy. So therefore, uh, India's dependence, uh, almost 90% of imported energy. So therefore, what we saw happen from the 70s was a dramatic surge uh, in oil imports, uh, as well as the, the value and the cost of those imports. This, in, uh, of course, uh, uh, has remains a major challenge for India, that because India uh, inflation sensitive and inflation is sensitive to energy prices. So therefore, what happens in the Gulf as a direct bearing on the Indian economy. The second factor, I think this was partly compensated by the fact uh, that uh, India exported large uh, number of uh, you know, working people into the Gulf. Uh, today, they're close to 8 million Indians uh, living in the, the Gulf alone. I'm not talking the whole of the Middle East in the Gulf alone. And the remittances they send home are partly compensate for the high price uh, we pay for the, for the oil. So in a vague... Uh, while uh, the India pays for the oil, uh, India also benefits from the construction and the, the economic activity uh, because the Indians are quite a key component of the labor market uh, in, the, in the Gulf. A third aspect has been, which has been less understood uh, uh, because India uh, historically uh, under, you know, had a historically a security role in the Gulf uh, under the British Raj that much of the security of the Gulf uh, and the Arabian Sea in the uh, northwestern quadrant of the Indian Ocean was done from Bombay, but Nehru uh, quite uh, uh, you know you know deliberately withdrew from the troll. But as we discovered over the last forty years, I mean the the security of the Arabian Peninsula and India are deeply interdependent. Uh, that uh, radical ideas that emerged out of the Arabian Peninsula have had a great effect uh, on the subcontinent. Uh, the forces of uh, relig violent religious extremism have encouraged uh, a, a whole lot of uh, new thinking in the subcontinent, partly accelerated by the Afghan jihad, uh, Pakistan's adoption of uh, you know Islamic instruments. Uh, so this this produced a, 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 a layer to the conflict uh, naturally existed between India and Pakistan. So therefore, the the impact of the Gulf politics. Uh, ideas about religion and politics, religion and society have a deep, deep impact on South Asia. So combating uh, violent religious extremism or terrorism uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a main challenge for India. And there, I think what we've seen happen is really the beginnings of uh, an expansive cooperation uh, with the moderate Gulf Arab states, uh, which includes uh, you know, UAE, Saudi Arabia, uh, as we speak. Uh, the president of Egypt, uh, LCC, is in India. Uh, terrorism, extremism are at the top of the uh, at the, at the conversation between uh, Mr. Modi and Mr. LCC. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is that the India in the past was so focused on supporting Arab nationalism against West and Israel. Uh, today is actually working with the moderate Gulf states, uh, which are very, uh, uh, which are today. Uh, 
engage Israel themselves. So the, that contradiction is no longer there. Second, I think they're also close partners for India in battling uh, religious extremism. And finally, uh, the economic links uh, between the subcontinent, between India and the, and the Gulf, mainly through the UAE and Saudi Arabia are growing rapidly. And India hopes that the Gulf capital, which has grown in large volumes, will play a big role uh, in India's acceleration of India's uh, economic growth. So I would say at this point, uh, the, the moderate Arab states are major partners. And over the last uh, few decades, India has also built up a good relationship with Israel. And now we have the I2U2, uh, India, Israel, uh, uh, Emirates and the United States. It's interesting that uh, these were the three forces we tried to keep away from, away from the United States, uh, away from Israel and away from the Gulf Arabs. Uh, today, I think uh, they're also close partners. And luckily for us, they work closely with Egypt. They, luck, they work closely with Israel. So I think we are in a very, very different framework uh, in dealing with the Middle East. That's a really great overview. Um, one of the points you brought up, um, I think, is, is really important that, that there are 8 million plus Indian residents in the Gulf alone. Uh, that really complicates or, or gives more depth, I guess, to the, the strategic side of things, to the defense side of things. When, when Indian leaders have to think about the Gulf, um, you know, security or insecurity here has a deep impact, I'm sure, on the domestic pol uh, political narratives within India itself. I'm sure everybody in India has family here. Everybody here has family back in India. It's a very deep enmeshment, I'd say. Yeah, it's, it's a huge, as you, as you rightly said, it's an opportunity as well as a danger. Uh, in sure. the, when uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, uh, you know, India had to evacuate, uh, you know, thousands of Indians from the, from the war theater. Uh, and later, uh, when uh, things were happening in Libya in 2016, if I recall right, India had to evacuate close to 30,000 Indians uh, from Libya. Mm. So I think uh, the presence of such a large number of Indians uh, also has increased responsibility on India for their security, for their welfare. So in a way, the use of Indian army, which Nehru uh, shunned uh, in the post-independence years, today uh, Indian uh, you know, security forces become critical for uh, uh, you know, evacuating uh, in crisis. And increasingly, uh, also work with the Gulf countries uh, to uh, improve the life and uh, improve the life of the Indian workers in the in the Gulf. You know, giving them better rights, uh, giving them better insurance, a whole range of factors. Because unlike uh, the previous governments, Mr. Modi uh, is deeply committed to the welfare of the Indian diaspora. So I think uh, that that brings it a whole new dimension, where he's taken it up. Uh, directly, and I think he's had some success with uh, with the UAE, with Saudi Arabia, uh, that which which are the two largest uh, hosts of Indian population, uh, to respond more positively to the concerns of the Indian workers. Oh yeah, well here in Abu Dhabi we see it. I mean, they're building an Indian temple here. Um, you know, the 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 Indian community is acknowledged as being a really important pillar of of the society here. I think something like forty percent of the UAE is South Asian, so you know that that interdependence works both ways. I would say. Um, you, you mentioned a lot about the Gulf, and I think that's it's, it's really interesting for me living here in the UAE and focusing a lot on Gulf international politics. There's been a bit of a shift for India, you know, as the GCC has become more important, and it's kind of backed away from Iran, which traditionally has been a little closer to India, um, at least in strategic affairs. Um, is this about the economic opportunity? Is it about, like you described, the, the population shift where there's so many Indian resi uh, residents living in, in the GCC countries? Or is there a larger geopolitical logic at play as well? Yeah, I, I think uh, there's been a lot of talk about India's partnership with Iran, but uh, it doesn't get anywhere because Iran is locked in a confrontation with its neighbors uh, and it's uh, locked in a confrontation with the U.S. and the, and the West. So uh, while Iran is important for India, surely because it has a huge border with Pakistan and Afghanistan, and it also provides access to India uh, to Central Asia. Uh, I, I, so, so therefore, from a long-term geopolitical perspective, uh, Iran is important. Um, its location, its population all make it important. But right now, there is not very much we can do with Iran. There was some coordination with them during the when the Taliban was in power. Hopefully, there'll be more uh, today again. But uh, the eight million people, the remittances, the oil we get from the Gulf—I mean, you know—is way, way above what we do with Iran. 
Uh, and while ideally we would like to do business with Iran, I mean, it's constrained, as I said, uh, the limits to what we can do with them. So I think uh, Iran, uh, the talk is more than the actual uh, action. While the Gulf, I think, uh, in the past, we tended to look at it very in a mercantilist fashion, merely looking at oil and the export of labor. Uh, one of the things Mr. Modi has changed uh, is really to take a more strategic view uh, of the Gulf, uh, that we can do things with them. And I think we're beginning to get a recognition that the kind of capital, what some of the scholars in, uh, in, in the Gulf have called the Khaliji capital, the volumes of Khaliji capital are so large that actually for an India that's looking for capital for its own growth, uh, it's going to be, uh, the Gulf is going to be a great partner. And in my sense is we're just beginning to explore those possibilities and, and uh, you'll see a lot more of that uh, happen. We've just signed an FTA with the UAE, as you know. Uh, hopefully, we can do something uh, similar with the, with the GCC as a whole. And a little more difficult uh, would be, while there are talks about India playing a security role, uh, that I think uh, we'll have to work out uh, in greater detail of how we do this uh, in, the, in the days ahead. I think one of the problems with the focus on the Gulf in the last uh, few years has been uh, we tended to neglect the Western part of the Arab world. Uh, our relationship with Israel have dramatically improved under Mr. Modi. Uh, but the Western part of the, the Levant, the North Africa, Egypt were neglected. And I think I would see LCC's visit uh, really uh, as, a, as a way of getting back to Egypt because Egypt was a great partner in the 50s and the 60s. So in some senses, uh, uh, you know, we're getting back to, because it's Egypt that has the heft uh, large population, large standing army, uh, and its pivotal position uh, in the region. Uh, so for us, uh, getting, getting back to Egypt brings back some balance into a policy which is not, uh, you know, just limited to the to the Gulf. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because that leads into you know my next question. You mentioned you know India's rising presence in the Levant, and and I was in Israel recently, and there was a lot of talk about. Uh, Israel India ties. Uh, pretty much everybody I spoke with were were becoming, you know, kind of expert on India very quickly because they were realizing um, that th that things have changed um, pretty dramatically, um, especially over the past year with this I two U two that you mentioned this this configuration of the two eyes of uh, Israel and India and the two U's of the UAE and the US. Um, so I I'm. Still surprised. It doesn't get as much notice here as I thought it would. Um, I'm not sure how people in other places are thinking about it. So, could you give our listeners just a quick description of of what I2U2 is, and how have the Abraham Accords um, reconfigured India's approach to the Middle East? Yeah, I think for us, for India, uh, given its uh, champion of championship of the Arab nationalism and its support for uh, Palestinians in the past. Uh, there was a problem of how do we normalize relationship with Israel while at the same time keeping up our traditional positions in the in the Arab world. And I think the uh, the Abraham Accords have actually made it easier uh, for us to, to don't have to constantly look over our shoulders. So I think that opened a lot of space for India to work with, uh, work with Israel and the Gulf Arabs at the same time. The I2U2 at this point, I mean, I think it's still uh, really the beginnings of... Uh, of a major project, uh, the initial focus uh, is on economic issues. But I think the the question how how soon would it acquire uh, a strategic character? So I would say, look, it'll take some more time. Uh, it's better to build this slowly uh, and uh, strongly rather than rushing into grand uh, uh, security structures at this point. But uh, the idea was uh, to to have the U.S. as part of this and get India, UAE, and Israel to do a lot more things. So this just, I think we're at the beginning of a process. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's been pretty interesting to watch at this stage because like you say, the focus I think has been very careful, um, you know, focusing on issues like food security, on development, on technology, you know, things that everybody needs more of um, and, and kind of keeping the geopolitics out of it. But of course, geopolitics is a big part of what we talk about on this show. And I think it's kind of hard to not think about what those consequences might be. I mean, I think the I2U2 members have been really good at framing it as a geoeconomic initiative, and it's not balancing against Iran. It's not balancing against China. There's no balancing. It's, it's meant to be inclusive. 
But I imagine the view from Beijing is pretty different. I think they probably see this and associate with other Indo-Pacific minilaterals like the Quad or AUKUS, and this seems to be yet another um, U.S.-centered approach to limiting Chinese gains in the region. Um, So I imagine in Beijing it's probably not perceived as as an entirely positive development. Uh, How are people in New Delhi thinking about the India-U.S.-China triangle in in the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, put it very bluntly, I mean, we'd rather have the Americans sit on the oil spigot than the Chinese. Uh, There's no question. I mean, there was a time when uh, we were very anti-American. But I think today, uh, given our contradictions with China, which have sharpened, uh, that we would rather see the U.S. remain a major player uh, in the uh, in the in the Gulf, and I think, uh, and in the Middle East as a whole, uh, that suits our larger Indo-Pacific strategy as well, because there uh, we need the U.S. might uh, to be able to produce a, a stable balance of power system in the East, and I think the same thing applies to the West. Unfortunately, uh, the Biden administration's uh, initial mistakes uh, in the in the Middle East uh, of uh, framing, uh, you know too much of this democracy versus autocracy business. Uh, it's, uh, you know, by targeting so much fire at uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, they, I think, uh, created problems for themselves uh, and, uh, you know, compelled, I think, the region to to diversify away from the U.S. But hopefully, I mean, uh, this is not a, a permanent rupture uh, and that uh, the U.S. would uh, come back to be a part of the security structure. Uh, 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 and remain an important part of the security structure because there's too much talk about U.S. pivoting away uh, or U.S. burning its bridges with the the Gulf. But I think uh, both sides will need each other. And for us, as we build our capabilities, uh, we'd rather have the Americans for as long as we can rather than uh, Americans leave. And we are not in a position to fill that vacuum. So so I don't think there are any illusions in Delhi that uh, if the U.S. leaves, we can simply step in so for us, I think uh, to work with the U.S., with France, with Britain, wherever possible, uh, to be able to have a, a, a structure there uh, that is not left to Russia and China to simply walk all over. Uh, but my sense is I hope that the Bush and Biden administration will begin to make the uh, adjustments necessary uh, to, to make sure uh, that, that there is no geopolitical vacuum out there. Yeah, I, I, I think that's really accurate. I actually also think that they they kind of have gotten their feet under them a little bit in the region in the past few months. You know, you saw um, there, everybody focused on the, the Biden trip to Saudi and the negative, um, you know, imagery that came of that or even the negative uh, consequences of it. But his trip to Israel, they signed this um, strategic dialogue on, on uh, technology cooperation. They're really showing that commitment. We saw recently uh, this this hundred billion dollar uh, development project with the UAE on on clean energy. Uh, you saw um, them them talking to Turkey just last week, um, and then in December there's a report about how the U.S. has been working with China, or sorry, with Saudi to help them develop their national security strategy. So it does seem that they've you know um, got some success that they're building on. And like you say, I think that's really good for countries like India, like the UK, like France, and Asian allies and partners that rely on this kind of U.S. security structure that that allows these countries to have, you know, their interests in the region met with a pretty low security cost. Absolutely. I mean, and and uh, because I think the, the depth of the ties uh, between U.S. and the, and to say, let's put more bluntly, the Anglo-American uh, world and the Gulf is so deep uh, mm-hmm. that uh, it will be, you know, it's not easy or wise for either side to simply walk away. But as you know, in Washington, you are right in the Beltway. I mean, there are always ideological groups uh, seeking, you know, you know, grand uh, solutions. But but I think uh, common sense will uh, will come back because the scale of uh, interest, because it looked like Gulf oil did not matter uh, when the Biden administration took charge. A year later, uh, it's it's so central to uh, to the to the world uh, of energy security, of uh, dealing with the consequences of the war in Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. Just that recognition that sure, the U.S. isn't reliant on Gulf energy, um, but everybody's affected by, you know, energy pricing. And of course, Gulf countries have a, a major role in this, right? So I think they've they've realized that they have to be involved here politically, um, and that might require 
them to maybe swallow some things politically that they weren't willing to maybe this time last year, especially like you mentioned the relations with Saudi, but, but I think it, it, it has been shifting. Um, it's also interesting too, because like we were just saying with I2U2, with the quad, um, you know, as you described, India has really reconsidered, uh, how it approaches its relations with the U S a lot this century. Um, this show, of course, we talk a lot about China, and I, I always see China as, as kind of an animating factor in that, that the strategic landscape in, in Asia has really changed with China becoming much more active uh, throughout Asia. Uh, but for India especially, I mean, I think of what China's been doing throughout South Asia, you know, with, with CPEC, with, uh, you know, its, its BRI projects in all of the smaller South Asian states. Um, so it really does seem for India that it's it's pretty difficult balancing act to, to consider how to, you know, cooperate with the U S without antagonizing China overtly, you know, uh, how, how, how do you see this India China relationship, um, right now? No, we have had a pretty rough relationship uh, with China. Uh, we've had a, a series of uh, military crises on the border, uh, in 2013, 2014, uh, 2017, 2020. So this idea that India should not, you know, get closer to the U.S. because China will get upset. Uh, that has been a powerful argument uh, in, because of India's historic non-alignment, Asian solidarity, uh, multipolarity, these kind of goals. I mean, it was a very deeply held view. But I think uh, we should really thank uh, Xi Jinping for pushing India to the other side. Uh, that whatever the ambivalences that India has had, uh, I think uh, Chinese military assertiveness uh, in the last uh, a uh, decade at the, in the Himalayas has really compelled India to, to take a fresh look. So I don't think there are any illusions uh, of the kind that Mr. Nehru started with, that uh, China is a natural partner for India in building a new order in Asia uh, and in the international system. Uh, those illusions are no longer there. I mean, that, that it's quite clear that we need the U.S., we need the West uh, to, to deal with the China's, uh, China challenge. But at the same time, it's it's a fact that uh, China's power has grown, dramatically grown on the on the economic front, and uh, its power is being projected into the Indian Ocean. And uh, the first military base abroad is in Djibouti, uh, right next to the to the Gulf, and probably they'll be looking around for new places to acquire a permanent military presence. So it's not it's no longer a question of whether, but it is a question of when. Notwithstanding the current crisis uh, in East China Sea and the South China Sea. Uh, I don't think China is going to give up its uh, two ocean strategy, uh, that it will continue to uh, project power into the into the Indian Ocean. And I think for India, this is uh, really, so a problem is not just in the Himalayas, but also in the, in the South, in the waters of the Indian Ocean. And the fact that uh, China has cultivated uh, special relationships uh, with the key island states, like Sri Lanka, Maldives, uh, Mauritius, Seychelles, uh, I think the Chinese presence is, has grown. So so this is a really a long-term challenge for India. And that again, I think, uh, makes it clear that uh, India has to work with, uh, with the Western partners. And that's why the Quad is so focused on maritime security issues and on doing a range of things uh, to secure the ocean spaces uh, uh, from being, uh, you know, Chinese taking a much larger role in this part of the world. So, so that I think is set now. It is both uh, in the in the Himalayas as well as in the Indian Ocean. Uh, India's problems with China are only going to rise. And uh, for all the talk about Xi Jinping's uh, charm diplomacy, uh, we haven't seen much in relation to India. Uh, they're doing a lot of sweet talk to the U.S. finance capital in Davos, uh, but with Japan, where they have a massive territorial dispute, or with India, uh, there is no sign of any uh, easing up uh, of the pressures. So uh, I don't see Xi Jinping giving up on uh, uh, the on the territorial questions uh, where they think it is their right uh, to unilaterally change uh, the borders. So I think our problems with China are only going to grow. Uh, while the U.S., there are sections which will continue to argue, look, uh, there is room for guardrails, there's room for collaboration. All that is fine. But, but my sense is uh, uh, for India, the contradiction with China will be the principal contradiction for the next uh, three decades and more, uh, coming decades. And addressing that, uh, any answer that we produce to will will necessarily involve the U.S. and its allies, in, not only in uh, in Asia but also in Europe. Hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of really great stuff in that. But one thing that I kept thinking about while you were describing this is is 
you know, this China-Iran relationship, which seems very troubling to folks in Washington. And I, I always caution, you know, just by looking at the numbers and saying, I, I don't think that China's engagement with Iran is really as deep as it's often portrayed. Um, I'm often asked to explain how, you know, China can, can have this good relationship with Iran and also have this good relationship with the Saudis and the Emiratis. And I think that a lot of folks seem to think that when, when China and Iran announced this strategic partnership or compre uh, comprehensive strategic partnership, that it would somehow alter the balance of power in the Gulf. And I didn't think that was the case at all. But I did think it, it did alter, or it has the potential to alter the balance of power in South Asia. You know, I thought that a, a deeper China-Iran relationship probably isn't going to mean much to, to, to Saudi in the big picture. But for India, it actually could be problematic. Do you agree with that assessment or do you think that it's not really a, a big no, deal in are, South Asia either? Yeah. You are right. And, and I think we should also see this as part of a growing Sino-Russian partnership. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, they've been enticing uh, Pakistan. I mean, in fact, the fact that Pakistan's Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Imran Khan, showed up on February 23rd in uh, in Moscow just before Putin was ordering the invasion. Uh, a lot of people thought, at least in Delhi, the speculation was that the Chinese encouraged him to go to Moscow. So this idea that, uh, you know, Russia, China... Uh, can draw in other, you know, partners in the greater Middle East to shore up their alliance. And and uh, both Pakistan and Iran are natural partners there. But Pakistan still has a lot of links with the UK and, and the US. So I don't see them, while well, they are very close to China, whether they will actually be allowed, you know, uh, they're trying to, I think, make some adjustments. Uh, the army now, after Imran Khan, you know, resetting the relationship with the US, uh, trying to reset the relationship with the US. With Iran, you know, it's it's always a difficult partner for anyone. I mean, uh, that, uh, you know, they're not easy to deal with. Uh, so it's not that the Chinese, just because they signed a declaration, it's automatically going to translate into uh, something, you know, immediate outcome. Uh, 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 they, they might be able to build a relationship over the period. And that will certainly, and if Russia and China do it together, it will certainly could become a problem for India. And uh, And the fact is, that Iran, uh, if, you know, unlike Saudi Arabia today or UAE, which are taking a more moderate position, uh, which are doing social reform internally, uh, we don't see Iran actually cracking down on what, uh, against the women, against the uh, various forces. So I think that's also going to be a problem for us. Uh, though ideally for us, an Iran that set uh, peace with the West uh, would provide us a lot of opportunities. But that's not in our hands to to produce. Yeah, yeah. There's there's just so many moving parts here, right? And you know, when you're talking about maritime security as being such an important consideration in the Indian Ocean region, um, I was thinking about Gwadar and how much China's you know put into this this port in Pakistan, and also thinking just up the coastline a bit and and Chabahar and how India has been you know working wanting to work on this for forever. Um, and starts making headway, and then something happens in Iran, or something happens with the Iran-U.S. relationship, and it just keeps getting harder. But uh, we saw a couple of years ago some Iranian officials talking about, you know, how they're very happy to engage much more closely with China on developing Chabahar. Um, I think that would really change the the maritime landscape for India if if, if China were, you know, investing deeply into that port, investing into Gwadar. Um, becoming a resident actor in a lot of other Indian Ocean ports, this could really be a, an issue for for India. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I think uh, the uh, we did build a, a terminal in uh, you know in in Chabahar, uh, one terminal, but you know Iranians are not a, a classical trading nation of the type that the Gulf Arabs are. So uh, the structure of their economy, uh, their the nature of their politics, uh, continue to prevent. Uh, where they have the natural uh, gateway to the to inner Asia, but but uh, getting that translating that beautiful line on the map into an operational corridor uh, will be will be quite hard, and I think uh, that's a part of the problem. So so and then the uh, uh, if the Chinese uh, do make a major presence uh, in the uh, in Iran in in Chabahar and to build a military relationship, and I think that's why it's important for India to step up on the security partnership with the Gulf Arabs. Uh, we need to do a lot more with them, uh, look for alternative routes. I mean, I think there are some people have suggested we could work through UAE, uh, Israel, Greece, you know, use, you know, 
routes into the Mediterranean rather than being fixated simply on cutting through Iran into the uh, into the to the north, uh, because it doesn't look like the regime uh, is is changing uh, on its own volition or is going to be forced out. Uh, because if Iran remains a bloc, uh, its uh, growing compulsion to align with Russia and China will grow. And, and, and that will be a problem, a serious problem for India. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's been really interesting to watch. I've been based in the Emirates now since 2006, and I've been watching this stuff for, for quite a while. And, you know, there's a point maybe... I guess in 2015, when there was so much talk about, or 2016, about all this talk about CPAC, and I thought, you know, uh, the China, China-Pakistan China Economic Corridor, it, it just seemed natural to me. I thought you'd see a lot more investment from the Saudis, from the Emiratis going into it. And I talked to a Pakistani official and he said, actually, we haven't really seen the money from the Gulf that we were hoping for. And he said, well, you know, I kind of blame their closer economic engagement with India. And it just seemed to me a really fascinating kind of rectangle where, you know, historically the GCC and Pakistan lined up pretty neatly and Iran and India lined up pretty neatly and that kind of explained things. And just in the past few years, it doesn't anymore. And you you just look at how those two very intense rivalries um, that spans across these, you know, the Gulf and South Asia really does uh, make for a very interesting geopolitical chessboard here. No, no, absolutely. If you take a longer view, I mean, uh, when, uh, in fact, uh, Iran and Pakistan and Turkey uh, were part of the, uh, you know, the CENTO, uh, then, you know, Iraq uh, left the Baghdad Pact. Uh, so we were closer to Iraq at that point. Of, we were, India was closer to the Baathists, uh, the guys in the pinstripes, uh, while the Turks, the Pakistanis, well, it was the Pakistanis who joined an anti-Arab alliance. While India was actually, you know, championing the Arab cause, uh, it was Pakistan, uh, no, that was the UK that sponsored uh, CENTO, but they didn't last uh, too long. Uh, and later, it's post seventies, we saw the Gulf Arabs come much closer to uh, uh, closer to Pakistan, and India tending to take a very negative view, and and uh, I think took a unidimensional view of the Gulf Arabs, and and I don't think we fully understood their problems uh, post seventy nine. I mean, uh, three you know three major things as you know happened in seventy nine. You had uh, uh, the Russian intervention in Afghanistan at the end of it, uh, Iranian revolution, the attack on uh, uh, the Grand Mosque in Mecca, as well as the Arab is- Arab e- Israel Egypt peace treaty. So, in a way, seventy nine dramatically altered uh, the structure of geopolitics uh, in the in the in the Middle East. And I think our our Russia connection uh, and our problems with Pakistan and the rise of Islamic terrorism, I think made us lose our way in terms of how we deal with the with the with the arabian peninsula which was uh, historically been close to us but i think we've overcome those uh, those hurdles today i think india does not view uh, the arabia uh, through the lens of pakistan or the lens of islam in fact it's very interesting that mr mbz and mbs are the closest friends mr modi has in the he in the in the middle east so so i think we are in a in a in a new situation and i think there's a lot more sophistication today in terms of how India uh, thinks about it. It's not uh, because Indian economy is, for example, 10 times larger than Pakistan's. So the Gulf uh, capital sees a lot more opportunities in India. Uh, and for Pakistan, it becomes say, uh, someone always seeking money to bail them out rather than it's not an in- investment opportunity. So I think those equations have changed. Uh, and Iran, which was very close to the West, I mean, is on the other camp today. Uh, but for India, I think the real prospect is the convergences with the Arab Gulf, with the moderates, with the West, have significantly increased, and with Israel. Uh, that's where I think uh, if we keep building up this relationship, uh, we should be able to counter any potential negative developments that could take place in Iran. Mm, yeah. Um, it's, it's funny, while you're describing this, I was just thinking, I, I took my, my family on a vacation to Kerala you know, in, in 2017, and we were driving across the province, and it was beautiful, but I kept seeing these large banners with pictures of different sheikhs from Saudi and from the UAE. And when I asked the, you know, the locals, what, why why so many? They're like, oh, there's so much investment that is poured in from Dubai, from Riyadh, from Abu Dhabi into this province. Um, it really just kind of hit home the 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 deep interdependence between, you know, India and the UAE, India and Saudi. 
it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the whole diplomacy, the, the whole always came from, you know, the crucial states to Indian West Coast. And after 73, we saw on a dramatic expansion of Indian labor exports. And Kerala was one major source of those, a source of those exports. So in a sense, Kerala has a very, very special connection to, uh, to, the, to the Gulf. And uh, you see them everywhere. Uh, though it's a tiny state by Indian standards, I mean its presence uh, in the in the in the Gulf is huge. Uh, but my sense is today the connections are much wider uh, in in uh, many other parts of India. And again, I mean I think the the Gulf capital, what it can do to uh, India's uh, real estate construction telecom sectors uh, is immense. And space, uh, for example, UAE has been very keen uh, to develop space cooperation with India. So I think we are looking at a whole range of possibilities in a, in a way that is positive. While the story with Iran is, is always a negative, negative mm. one. Okay, how do we deal with the Taliban, or uh, how do we, you know, you know, contain uh, Pakistan support for uh, crazy forces in Taliban in, in Afghanistan? But I think the the economic dimension with the Gulf Arabs is huge, and as Gulf opens up, uh, becomes more moderate politically. Uh, and modernizes socially uh, the, the 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 connections uh, between India and the Arab Gulf will only will only deepen. So, so I would say this is really we just at the beginning of shall we say the whole line of a really beautiful relationship. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a really fascinating time to watch this stuff. Um, before I moved to the Gulf, I'd spent you know most of my twenties living in East Asia. And when I came here, I had this in my mind, you know, I was going to a different place. I was going from Asia to the Middle East. And then, you know, having been here so long, I think of the Gulf as, you know, rather than the the easternmost limits of of the Middle East, I think of it as more of the westernmost limits of of this bigger Asia. And you you know, you just see so much happening here in that space. You know, I, I had a group of students from the US visit our campus last semester and they were saying, like, wow, this this is a really kind of westernized place. They were in Dubai and I was like, this is very Asian. Look around. Everybody you see is from India or they're from Sri Lanka or they're from the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And it really is this kind of Asianization process, which the way you're describing, like all these opportunities and economic engagement and space and tourism, you know, you can see a lot of this stuff happening all the time, this really positive narrative, which, you know, frankly, in the West, we don't hear very many positive narratives about the Middle East. It's usually a problem to be solved. And that's just not the way it's kind of described. Uh, you know, I'm, this is late January that we're recording this. Um, just last week, the the South Korean president was here in town. They're talking about cooperation on nuclear, on on defense, on security, on on any number of things. It really is. You're seeing a lot of these linkages between Asian countries and societies, and these Gulf ones or, or Middle Eastern ones really intensifying in a very interesting way. Absolutely, and I think uh, I see even you know many people from the Gulf who land up in Singapore used to say, "Oh, we are in Asia." Uh, the notion, you know, that Middle East and Asia were different. Well, partly, yeah. I think uh, the 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 colonial era uh, way the these divisions were identified in the foreign offices of the West, uh, Near East, Far East, uh, Middle East. Uh, I think those divisions are breaking down. I think because East Asia is an economic dynamo, uh, West Asia, I mean, say, has all the energy resources as the capital now to to transform the region and then we see the integration of uh, north africa the uh, north uh, you know the horn of africa uh, i think you see this fusing uh, of uh, east and west asia uh, we we had this talk about you know nehru in the 40s talking about asia we we said look west asia east asia but it had no economic component at the time uh, it was really a political idea uh, right. Today, it is being driven by by economics, uh, by commerce, by by movement of labor, capital. Uh, this is uh, this is where I think the real connections uh, get established. And my sense is uh, there'll be more and more of this, where the Gulf capital contributes to the growth of the rest of the region, while the movement of people into these countries uh, for labor and for other purposes uh, will also grow. So, so I think we're going to see uh, Asianization of uh, Asia in a, in, in a sense. No, absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, but I also am somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about geopolitics. And, you know, while I, I love these positive stories, the cultural, the, you know, my students who are fascinated by South Korean, you know, cultural products and Japanese manga and India, you know, Bollywood film. But I kind of also see the, 
you know, the, the, the dark cloud on the horizon too. And I, I do see there's a lot of tensions geopolitically across Asia, which often don't feature, you know, in this broader narrative of the Asian century, you know, nothing but bright skies ahead, economic growth, mm-hmm. folks on FTAs. Um, do you see, like me, I know you think about geopolitics a lot. Do you see the potential for these Asian tensions that are kind of beneath the surface spilling out into the Gulf in a way that folks here haven't had to think about very much yet? Yeah, I think the Asian century was always a simplistic uh, idea. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's really still the colonial, post-colonial argument. I mean, if you think of the European century or European centuries, uh, it was full of conflict, right? I mean, this no, I mean, European story was also about inter inter-European conflict, uh, both within the continent as well as for the colonies outside. So I think the the myth of uh, you know that Asia is one uh, has been broken because of China's own assertiveness. Uh, and uh, its attempt to alter uh, territorial status quo across the region. But I think, as I said, for the commerce, I mean, it is producing new connections. I mean, both the movement of capital and labor uh, producing new connections. Uh, And I think this, over the longer term, we still need a security architecture. It can't just be built on ideas of Asian century or Asian unity, because even after, say, 400 years after Europe's rise, right, it still doesn't have a security architecture, as we discovered uh, last year, mm-hmm. uh, that uh, the notion that Europe has transcended geopolitics, I mean, has turned out to be utterly false. Uh, so similarly in Asia, I, mean, I think we have a long way to go. But I think if we can build on the positive forces, and it's again, it can't be something exclusive, uh, that it should not be that Asia, you know, for a long time, this framing Asia versus the West, East versus the West, a lot of it uh, really was self-defeating because I think uh, we need the West, uh, Western powers, if you will, I mean, and the, uh, to, to be able to stabilize this region. And uh, Asia will increasingly contribute to the, to the West as well. So, so I think the, the, if we can keep backing up the positive forces in the region while keeping in check the negative forces, those who want to establish hegemony, but there's Iran trying to establish hegemony in the Gulf in the name of religion, or the Chinese trying to do it in the name of their great China dream, uh, then I think the, the positive story can, can uh, you know, can be expanded, uh, I would say. That to me is a, a perfect note to end on. You know, we're ending with uh, something positive that doesn't come up much on shows like this where we're talking about a lot of Middle Eastern geopolitics. So, so thank you. Um, Raja, I always enjoy talking politics with you. I always learn a lot from it, from, from your, uh, your perspective. I mean, you've been based in so many fascinating places. You, you know, everybody you've, you've really looked at this from a lot of angles. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you. It was wonderful speaking to you today, Jonathan. Okay. And hopefully I'll see you either here in Abu Dhabi soon or, or, or in India to our listeners. Thanks for joining us again. Um, please check us out on, uh, you know, on, on our YouTube channel or like and rate and subscribe and all that stuff on, on Stitcher, Spotify, and iTunes and all those great uh, venues. And we'll see you next month. Thank you. Produced by HeartCast Media.